Hello, I am Rujika Chitravanshi. Uh, we have with us today uh, Ms. K. Sujata Rao. She is a leader in public health and has served as the uh, former secretary of uh, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, uh, where she has been involved in the first ever national program for non-communicable diseases, the process for national uh, policy for use of antibiotics, and also introducing vaccines in public health. Ms. Rao, it is so good to have you here with us. Welcome to the show. Thank you. So uh, let us uh, cut to the chase and ask the main big question as we do this post-budget analysis. Health was not a big spotlight as so many of us had expected to be in this year's budget, especially because it followed a deadly COVID wave. How do you assess the health budget of India this year? As you rightly said, you know, I was, I was one among you to be deeply disappointed that the budget did not reflect the priority to health. Uh, that it deserved, considering that the huge mess that we are in today, economically, social fabric-wise, the work systems, like whatever, intersectoral impacts of COVID has been so devastating. So it was mainly health which drove the devastation that we have faced the last two years. And I really thought that, you know, the political leadership would say never again. Because the virus, everyone knows that virus is not, this is not the end of the viral outbreaks. We've had so many in the last decade. We're gonna have some more in the following decades, maybe even worse than this. So we have to build a very resilient health system that minimizes the damages that viral outbreaks can cause. You know, it's, it's not uh, possible to stop everything, but we can certainly minimize it. And the inspiration should not be that America could not fix it. The inspiration should be that Vietnam, Thailand, Sri Lanka, they managed and they didn't have the kind of deaths or the cases that we had in India. So it is a manageable, it is manageable uh, and it is possible to contain a pandemic even as virulent as the Delta pandemic was. Yeah, but you know, the health sector came into focus because of the pandemic. Do you think this year's budget is sort of an indication that government feels that the threat of the pandemic is over and we have other priorities to uh, look into which, which have got more attention in the budget? You know, the government is not at all in an enviable position because the pandemic has devastated its economic uh, structure. So we all know the economy, I mean, loss of jobs have been immense. Unemployment has been exacerbated. You know, so in every aspect, we've had uh, to go uh, really down on account of the COVID uh, pandemic. So it was really juggling your priorities with limited resources because the, the tax buoyancy has not been also so expected because of the economic fallouts of the pandemic. So I didn't expect a huge budget rise, but I did expect a greater attention considering the economic survey, Ruchika, if you have read, is full of. Uh, uh, the pandemic, you know, it started and it was contextualized within the background of the pandemic. So I expected that the budget would start saying that today we are meeting at a time when we have just got over such a huge pandemic. We are on our way out and I think it's possible to be optimistic about it. And we have to rebuild once again. And therefore, health will have to get a decent uh, uh, allocation and they could have, they could have given us 2% of the GDP instead of leaving us at 1.2. That would have stimulated the states also to spend. And I think that is possible. Your next question may be, how do we raise the money? And that is possible by having put wealth tax. Yes, yes. In fact, have, uh, the 2% target seems very elusive. Uh, and uh, there's always this tussle health and between center and state, everybody has to increase. Now, while there wasn't overall and a big increase in the health budget if we look into the nitty gritties we see there is increase in nhm allocation the national health mission the pm swasthya suraksha yojana uh, how do you see all these developments and will they do enough for the health sector see nhm is the main driver uh, or the main instrument that the central government uses hmm. to do all disease control programs reproductive child health and so on with the states that's a partnership platform where the central government gives 60% of the money and the states put in 40%. So that's the only way where central transfers are taking place to the states. And what has been the increase this time? 7%. It's not been an awful increase and 7% is not been keeping to inflation. So the net growth of NHM money is very limited. 
and they already have liabilities of their own. I mean, as I said, there are committed expenditures within the NHM budget. So where is that flexibility to give that push to build the surveillance systems, to give that push to build the resilience that is required to fight uh, infectious diseases, you know? So that was one. When you mentioned the PSS, uh, PMSSY, they're also from 7,000, it went up to 10,000 crores, which is okay. I mean, you know, the point is by the time the tenders get settled and all actual expenditure, I don't know what it will be in the RE stage, but that's going for district hospitals, which do require that capital expenditure. Uh, it's a good uh, uh, step forward that they've enhanced it, but that's so small. I mean, what is 3,000 rupees crore uh, increase when you're talking about needing an infusion of some one lakh crores of uh, uh, rupees, you know? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, distributed among the states, it'd be some 200, 300 crores for each state. Hardly two, three hospitals can be uh, built up. And if you look at uh, the interstate differentials for money, Bihar and uh, states like, like Bihar and uh, Eastern UP, for example, require construction and investment in the hospital infrastructure. There's nothing there. Yeah. People might have just died because for want of mere basic minimum care, yeah. which a district hospital ought to have given, you know. So there is a huge gap between the infrastructure and the capital needs and the money that's being year on year being provided in the budget. Mm. And we just simply cannot afford to try and push all these issues under the carpet and hope for things to settle down. It's not a question of settling down. It's a question of being serious about health and education for a change. They shouldn't be looked at as expenditure items as something that we have to spend upon. No, it's an investment. Mm -hmm. You don't have a healthy people. You don't have an educated people. What's the use of all these roads and airports and ports and uh, railways and Bande Matrams and so on and so forth? If people are spending all their money, do you know, during this pandemic, one estimate, I'm not an authority on this and it may be wrong, but one estimate showed that during wave two, which is just three or four months span, people might have spent not less than 70,000 crores on treating, getting treatment. Yeah, the outer of course, yeah. You can make sense because it costs one lakh on average per day in the ICU. So, you know, if you really extrapolate that to the number of cases, 70,000, I mean, if people are going to be spending all the money at a time when they've lost their jobs, look at the impoverishment that people have been subjected to and the number of people who got pushed below poverty line on account of lack of medical facilities and care which the government ought to have provided. Yeah. Then the task is immense, you know, and some sensitivity to the suffering ought to have been uh, really shown rather than just dismiss off health under two schemes, some digital health and uh, yeah. mental teleconference. I mean, even if you take mental health, the task is huge. Yeah. It doesn't get covered with some 23 centers of excellence that's just a small, you know, pie in the sky. Yeah. In fact, those were the only two things that the FM talked about, specific uh, uh, measures that will be taken, telemedicine and telehealth. But uh, what impact, what dent would it really make? Nothing, because the telehealth is not easy, by the way, you know. The increase is from 50 crores, the RE increased to 75 and then now in this budget estimate, they've increased it to 200 crores. Okay, it will help getting a couple of IT professionals to do some software development and so on. But the real investment to make it uh, into, you know, the digital uh, framework in the architecture, in the manner in which it is conceptualized, will take us a decade and almost some 20,000 crores investment will be needed. It's a hugely, it's very... Uh, futuristic, it must come in, it will come in one day. I'm not saying no. But when your house is burning, you're not going to think about, you know, the best way to make a fireproof house, no? You want to just see that the fire uh, stops and you save and salvage what you have. And on, in terms of mental health, that's the most neglected uh, subject in our health ministry. And I'm party to that, uh, I'm guilty of that in the sense that, you know, we just never paid any attention to mental health, which is a serious error, policy mm -hmm. error over the decades. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got uh, personally uh, aware of it only in the, when I was writing the NCMH report. And Nimhans came up with an exhaustive 200-page report on status of mental health in the country. And that really showed us that 6% of people had mental illnesses. 
and the most expensive drugs were mental health, those required for mental health, you know. And, uh, and we had nothing really on the ground, nothing at all. The, the, there are no human resources. Uh, it's very acute. The number of psychiatrists or psychologists per lakh population available is very, very little. So there is a huge revamping. So a good act has come about since then. I mean, that's one thing I can be happy that at least I initiated the formulation of an act. And that took its space and, uh, you know, my colleague after me, Keshav Desiraju, really pushed it. So that, that implementation requires huge amount of resources again. And what has the budget provided? 610 crores for mental health, of which almost 590 will go to just two institutions. Nimhans and the, one more, Guru Tej Bahadur Institute of Mental Health, I forget the name. But, you know, so what is the amount left for all the interventions that you have to make? To, to take mental health at the community level, at the personal level, at the individual level. Mm -hmm. Because NIMHANS has its own yeah. uh, expenditure, which it cannot cut. It has its staff, it's a specialized institution, and uh, so on. And it's one of our finest institutions in the country. It requires even more budget, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. But then we're talking about community health. We're talking about interventions that require uh, immediate addressing of uh, uh, you know uh, issues of mental illnesses which can be treated and which can be cured not everybody needs at all to be in a mental asylum now i said these are such important issues that you know it's just not a question of taking a tele tele health thing and giving counseling mental health cannot be sorted out by counseling how many will come forward and relate their problems in an impersonal environment like a tele health it's yeah. not possible and in telehealth, we're not able to even manage diabetes management properly because every month a new doctor comes at the end and he changes the, uh, uh, you know, the medication for the diabetic. And there's no system of review to say whether patient management is being done well or not. So mm -hmm. mental health is not necessarily, it's not counseling, you know, alone. It requires a much more deeper engagement with the person who's having any kind of deviant behavior and a mental illness. Yeah. And that cannot be resolved by just resorting to telehealth alone. Mm -hmm. So, okay, I'm happy that a mention of mental health and its importance was recognized, but we have a far way to go and I want to be impatient and ambitious for health. So I'm not going to be happy with what's happened, uh, been announced. Yeah. You know, in the beginning, you rightly pointed out that obviously the economy is battered. We have uh, so many people who have been driven uh, to poverty and there is uh, big unemployment problems. For you, if you were designing the health budget, what are some of the key things that you would have pushed for? What would have been your ideal health budget in current circumstances? In the current circumstances, I think I would have put in much more money on strengthening primary health care through the NHM system. Mm. Uh, and I would have put my budget over there. And, uh, you know, but let me also give you a caveat, and that is with that one rupee, there's only that much you can do because the, the committed expenditures also. Like I can't wind up RML and AIMS and I can't wind up the several schemes which the central government also has to run, right? So within the little envelope that I have, I would have probably put my pitch on NHM much more than any other scheme and uh, driven this primary health care and community resilience for future pandemic uh, uh, pandemics that might take place and uh, and then raised an issue for uh, you know raised an issue for greater investments in infrastructure development we really do need a huge boost of in, in infusion in the district health district hospitals community health centers and so on and that requires the attention that i don't think enough was given yes that's very, I would have, very I would have right it on, uh, on strengthening primary care and human resources for health. Much more on training, for example. Yeah. Human resources has been a big neglect, neglected area uh, in healthcare because no matter how much infrastructure yeah. we built, as you pointed out, yes. there's lack of psychiatrists. Yes. So, you know, there's a, and there's this something, a concept called task shifting. Hmm. So, you know, you may not be able to ever reach the goal of getting the psychiatrists the way U.S. or U.K. and developed countries have. Hmm. But you can certainly have uh, a relatively lesser qualified person trained on mental, how to handle a mental illness. 
In fact, the act even encourages family relatives, um, family members, and trains them on how to handle uh, mental disability, uh, mental uh, illness, you know. So there's a lot of training uh, required, and I would have looked for some new initiatives on that front in the, in the budget if I had something to do with it. Absolutely. In other words, plug the loopholes that we found to our horror in the wave two. Mm. You know, that is the most important message that COVID has given, that your human resources are not trained enough, they're not uh, being able to, uh, you know, step up their care element, that your public hospitals are not, uh, um, you know, adequately uh, equipped. Your primary health system has virtually collapsed, so they're not able to treat people at the community level and all are coming forced to come to the city hospitals, crowding them that you don't have a proper financing arrangement with the private sector, so they were able to gorge and exploit patients who were vulnerable. You never had guidelines to say which hospital at which level should have oxygen, uh, you know, have self-sufficiency in oxygen supply. So there were a lot of little, little things that came out. And I would have liked to have documented all those learnings and seen to that this budget reflected those uh, investments in, in plugging those uh, uh, gaps and those learnings, you know, and it can't be done in a year. I understand that, but at least sort of laid the foundation for the next couple of years where the investments continue to grow. Perhaps a much, much in-depth and deeper understanding of what are the cracks in our system that the yes. pandemic has exposed needs to be done. As lay people, we do understand oxygen availability, bed availability, manpower availability. But I'm sure the issues are much more nuanced and there's so much more to do. You very rightly pointed out that the task is immense. Our primary healthcare system really needs a boost. And uh, we need to take our lessons and take them seriously going forward in the health sector. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Rao, for uh, adding, for Just sharing. One more I mean, please. when I see infrastructure, the laboratories, yes. you remember how we were just stuck. So, you know, it's not very expensive to really invest on having that every district. Do you know that Bihar did not have a laboratory which could do an RT PCR test in yes. the whole state of Bihar? I mean, public or private sector. So, you know, these are investments that ought to be made absolutely immediately. And it doesn't cost much. In Hyderabad, we have set up with Tata Trust uh, a wonderful laboratory for about a six to 10 crores investment. That's it. And it's one of the finest laboratories that, we, that I can think of, you know. So there are strategies available. There are uh, fund, funds available and it's not really expensive to have uh, dedicated some amount of money for laboratory strengthening. So, so there are a lot of little things like this, which I think should have found mention. And I would have liked it if uh, the finance minister had drawn our attention of the country to these gaps, because it would then indicate the political intention, you know, then even if the money is not so fully or adequately provided, but at least there is that articulation and awareness that these are important issues. Mm -hmm. rather than just dismissing health off as some digital, uh, as if for want of digitized records we are suffering. Mm -hmm. That's not the most important priority. Okay, that's fine. Maybe you can think about it in 2025. Mm -hmm. But not now. Now you need a lab where people, you and I can go and get a decent test done. Yeah, very rightly pointed out. Even if budget did not uh, allocate, it could have given a direction. And as you very rightly said, articulated some of the issues that need urgent attention. Uh, budget is a political, Ruchika, budget is a political document, yeah. it's not a financial document, it is. okay, that gives you the intention and shows where the heart of the rulers lie, where the government is laying its priorities, what it considers to be important for it, for, it for the people of India. Yeah. So that's where, you know, uh, it's a political statement and I would have liked a paragraph for it. Yeah, it not speaks volumes. Statement. Great. Thank you so much, Ms. Rao, for joining us today. It was so nice to talk to you and for all the insights that you shared. Uh, I hope we see a better health budget next year. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.